Welcome back. The question of land has been on the agenda of South African politics for a very long time. And this also led to the breakaway of the PAC in 1959. It was formed then. One of the ardent proponents of this view is the late Robert Mangaliso Sobukwe, who was later arrested and kept on Robben Island, isolated and uh, by government decree for that matter, was not sentenced for the additional time that he spent by the courts. So for years it remained a popular phase for land to be returned to black Africans. But who was Robert Sobukwe? Because not many people now, younger South Africans in particular, know the story of this man. He was popularly known as Prof. And I'm joined by the author of Sobukwe's biography, How Can Men Die Better, Benjamin Program. A pleasure, Benji, to catch up with you once again. Thanks, Tim. I appreciate it uh, that you could make time to be with us. Let me start with that uh, name that he was given. He, you know, it was, it was called Prof. Uh, well, that was an, a, a, a respect. Yes. Because he was the first um, black person to be appointed at WITS uh, among the first as a teaching assistant. He wasn't a lecturer, but later on Rhodes offered him the first full-time lecturer position in any, quote, white university. Yeah. And he turned it down because by then he had decided to launch the anti-pass campaign and he knew he faced imprisonment. And he took the decision, he agonized over it, whether to commit himself to his people or take a nice, safe job at Rhodes University, well-paid, exceptional, he decided to commit himself to his people. And that from the time he was arrested on March 21, 1960, to the time of his death, 18 years later, he was never free. Mm. Which, uh, again, will look at different parts of what happened to his freedom. When he got into politics, was a relatively young person. In his 20s, well, he was first at Fort Hare, but he'd yes. gone quite late. He'd had TB, yes. the usual pattern then for black youngsters. He missed uh, one or two years between primary, senior school. He dropped out because he was ill. So by the time he finished, he was already, you know, more mature than most people are today. Yes. And he went to Fort Hare. And the amazing thing was, until he started studying what was called then native administration, he'd never been conscious of black disabilities. It was an extraordinary thing. And yet overnight, he became aware and became interested. And then just like a meteor, took off, became a student leader at Fort Hare. He made uh, speeches then, which have gone down in history as these remarkable statements. And when you read them again today, mm. they're as fresh as, a, as, as they, they were being said today. Well, you got to know him. Tell, tell me how you met and then your friendship, how it evolved, because I want to ask certain sure. personal things about, about well, your relationship with him. I, was, I came to Johannesburg from Cape Town. I'd been at uh, Varsity there. And I was in an industrial company for a year, and I was engaged uh, to someone then, and she was studying Zulu, and she was telling me about this remarkable man, this wonderful teacher. And at the same time, I was going to black meetings to cover for a magazine called Contact, which is a liberal party. I was a member of the liberal party. And I was hearing about this amazing man who was coming up in the ANC called the, uh, Among the Africanists. And one day I went to fetch my fiancée at Witz, and she introduced me to her lecturer, Mr. Sabukwe, and it was just one of those instant coming togethers. We, were just, we just liked each other immediately. And our friendship developed. I used to go and visit him at home in Soweto. He used to come to our apartment in Kilani, which was against the law, of course, and I broke the law going to Soweto. And we talked and we talked. We agreed on, on a lot. We disagreed on a lot. And we talked and simply it grew. And then he was imprisoned and I made contact with him. And gradually over the years, because there was no one else doing it, I gradually simply had to do things until, and our friendship grew, grew and grew and grew. And then he spent six years on the island. They threw him off when he wasn't well uh, into banishment in Kimberley. And we were seeing each other all the time. We was as close as any two human uh, beings could be. I suppose this should be highlighted because it was a travesty on top of a travesty when he was sentenced to three years in jail and then given an additional years uh, on Robben Island, isolated with no human contact as yes. much as possible, no visits and so forth, and that by decree, not even as Correct. a court judgment. It's one of the interesting reflections of a prof, of Robert Sabukwe, 
he was this extraordinary human being, and it was a strength and a weakness in the story I'll tell you. He told me that on the island, the then Minister of Justice, a man by the name of Pelsa, had been to see him. And I said, what do you think of him? He said, oh, I liked him. He was a good human being. And I said to him, but Bob, he's the man who's signing your orders, keeping you on Robben Island. And he said, no, no, he, he, he was a nice guy. And he was unhappy that I was saying to him that Pelsa wasn't mm. so good. Mm. And I said, well, you know, uh, he, he was a man responsible. He said, no, no, it was a cabinet decision. I but said, now, but now he broke away from the ANC to form the PAC, right? And uh, also an Africanist. Today, when we go back in time, people might feel he was what could be called a radical hothead. But you know, your book, "How Can Man Die Better," does not does not portray him as such. What do we need to understand about his personality and character? In, in, that, in that way, that you know, whoever would break away and say land first and all sorts of things and subsequent the uh, Sharpville shooting, which partly he was uh, responsible for mobilizing people, not, not the massacre itself, but for mobilizing people for that date. What is it that terrified the state so much about him? It was basically he was a man of total commitment. When he thought into an issue, as I said earlier, offered a full-time lectureship, he turned his back on it, turned commitment to his people. There was an honesty and integrity in him which appealed to people and which was his characteristic. That's what made him great. He was a wonderful orator in a very quiet way, but he got through to people. The main thing all the time is a commitment to his people. Now, I'll pick up with one thing. You mentioned the land issue. It's a big issue today. Mm. It wasn't then. It wasn't discussed. Uh -huh. The big issues at the time, we're talking about the late 1950s, firstly, how to end white domination. The immediate issues were the past laws. The laws which were the basis of apartheid, which ensured control of every black person, because the people might not know or remember, every black person, male and female, over the age of 16, had to carry the dompas, mm. the little book. A policeman would stop you on the street, didn't have it on you, immediate arrest. Look at the book, didn't show you had a legal right to be in Johannesburg or you hadn't paid your taxes, immediate arrest, a thousand a day. It was the most hated feature of apartheid. To control the movement of people Absolutely. around the country Absolutely. from birth to death and where you could stay, where you could receive treatment and so on. Absolutely, yeah. total control. And it was the most hated thing. That's why the anti-pass campaign. The second one was poverty wages. Tremendous poverty in the country. Those were the two immediate issues. And that's what the Africanists went for. Land didn't feature. The only time that Sabuka really spoke about it, he said there's got to be an equitable redistribution of wealth in this country. The land issue featured in the Freedom Charter of 1955 when it said the land shall belong to those who work it. And I'm not quite sure what that means. And the Freedom Charter was dismissed by the Africanists as a stunt because the Freedom Charter people um, were pushing this line. The Africanist argument was in 1959, the ANC under the prodding of the then Youth League had adopted what was called the Program of Action, which meant non-collaboration with the enemy, the white rulers. And they said the Freedom Charter was just a stunt to get away from direct action against apartheid. That was the basis of the Africanist argument and contact with Africa, mm -hmm. which was something new then also. So when you listen to the debate today and you go back to his time, how do you think he would have handled this debate look, on the basis of what he said then? To talk about if, I don't know, but I'm, you know, I look at uh, what's happening here today and uh, I think you summed it up. <laughs> I'm as confused as most people. Yeah. I don't know what it means. I, I hear people, I read things. Uh, my, to, my anxiety is simply that in going ahead with land reform, which is certainly needed, that the country doesn't chase away foreign investment, which South Africa's got to have, whether you like it or not, whether you're a socialist, a capitalist, whatever you are, this country's got to have foreign investment, and it's not getting it. And the second one is that this does not destroy food security. 
In other words, that South Africa doesn't go along the road of Zimbabwe and destroy itself in this process. And I feel when I listen to people, there's a lot of populist, mm. just appealing to people's base feelings, base emotions. It's a great worry. Benjamin Pogrant is my guest, and we will be reflecting on the life of PAC founder Robert Sobuk. We'll continue with that, as well as look at the state of media today and the situation in the Middle East at this time.